Hey, thanks for checking out episode number two of this pellet wood door build project here at Next Level Carpentry. Episode number one gave an overview of the layout of the episodes and what the door is going to end up looking like. And I'm actually in the middle of shooting video for episode number three, where I assemble these jam parts and then cut them and make the door jam out of them. But to come up with wood that's straight, true, and accurate enough for glue up and assembly of a door jam like this, there's a lot of prep work that goes into it. So in this episode, I go deep into the weeds to show what it takes to take terribly twisted pallet wood and turn it into straight, true pieces for making a one-of-a-kind door jam like this that will replace the cardboard doer in my shop. That means what you'll see in this video can be applied to door making in general and not necessarily specific to this pallet wood door project. It's somewhat less straightforward because I'm making an exterior style jam with this step in it rather than just a flat piece of wood like in a typical interior door jam that has applied stops rather than the integral stop that's milled right into this jam itself. So you'll see the prep work that goes into transforming pallet wood into parts for a jam like this, although the rabbiting and assembly of the jams here uh, with the glue up and then the, the door jam assembly won't be included until episode three. So you'll want to stick around to check that out when it gets uploaded in a week or so. And some of you might be curious what these two sticks are for. If that's you, stick around and I'll show you. And I'll try to keep it from being long-winded. This corner of the next level carpentry shop still has some organizational issues, but it's due in part to this stack of pallet lumber that I've collected for building the door. I like the fact that the G700 dust processor is so portable because I can easily swing it out of the way to get at this lumber. There's some remarkable lumber in this pile, not the least of which is some beefy sticks of solid cherry. But to start the jam building process, I need to dig the cherry out of this pile to see what I have to work with for making the jam and the strips of cherry on the casing. Just look at the stuff and imagine, if I hadn't rescued it from the pallet pile, the stuff would all be in the landfill by now. The rest of the stuff is mostly maple and ash, uh, a little bit of oak and a couple sticks of poplar. But the maple and ash will get used for building the door frame itself and then the highlight strips in the casing. But that'll be in another episode. Well, uh, the warp, twist, bow, wane, checks, cupping, and everything else uh, with this lumber makes it a bit of a challenge to work with, but it's great raw material for a project like making this jam. The jam has thick and thin sections, a number of places that are easy to disguise glue lines. So I'll be able to select through this lumber, pick out which piece will make the best fit for which part of the jam, and just move forward. So even though this stuff starts out pretty gnarly, I want to show in this episode that it's possible to take some pretty tough lumber and with good equipment that's well-tuned and sharp, you can make beautiful lumber out of some pretty rugged stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a full-scale mock-up, like a proof of concept of the door jam with the rabbits and steps and cuts in there. And that'll help me think through the process of what I need to do to end up with that shape. And with that in mind, I'll be able to select pieces out of here better for making that jam. Well, I've got my proof of concept uh, jam mock-up here set rather in place to visualize how all this has to come together for the door to work. If you've been watching other parts of the series, you already know that I'm building an exterior style jam so that I can have weather stripping in it, which will keep dust and noise from migrating out of the shop when I don't want it to. I made this mock-up section extra thick because when I use the invisible hinges, they need a beefy jam to attach the hinge body to because it'll go right through a normal three quarter inch thick door jam. Only the hinge side jam will have this extra thickness. That's needed for screws when I use the concealed hinges in this frame. The head jam and the strike jam will only have a three quarter inch thickness in this area. So I need to make one jam leg that's a full two inches thick, and then the head and the other jam leg can be just an inch and a half. But the widths are all gonna be the same. Because this whole design started out as a SketchUp model, this is the first time I've actually seen it in physical form and I'm confident of the design. I really like it, but the final determination what type hinge I'll use will have to do with the amount of distance that the jam projects here, because if the invisible hinges don't clear that part of the jam, I'll have to use a regular knuckle hinge for this door. In that case, the extra jam thickness won't be necessary. Working with rough lumber is always a hip shot, and working with rough pallet lumber is like a hip shot in the dark, but I need to rough out these pieces for making that door jam and unfortunately, these are 
uh, 9 feet 11 inches long, not 10 feet. Uh, if I was ordering lumber, I'd probably get 12 footers, cut them 8 and 4, and make all the pieces. But this is what I've got to work with. So I can't risk cutting things too close. So I'm just going to pick the best 8 feet out of these uh, and use that for the jams. And then I'll have to use some of this other stuff for the head pieces. And there's going to be some scrap from the inefficient length of these pieces in relation to what I need to make out of them. But that'll get used for something else somewhere along the way. So I'll just flip through these and lop off the best eight feet and go from there. And I leave a little extra length on there so that I can have a nice clean cut on both ends to study the wood grain orientation. And now that I have these pieces uh, cut to very rough length and a jam mock-up, um, proof of concept made, I can start the actual milling process for turning these gnarly pieces of timber into a pretty refined, custom-designed door jam. And because I'm using this pallet wood, there's a couple extra layers of complexity in this build. But if I were building this same frame from kiln-dried lumber that was purchased at a hardwood supplier, I'd probably be starting at this stage. I would have bought uh, eight-quarter lumber in the right length so that I could get optimum yield out of the pieces, etc. I wouldn't have as much work to do to take all this twist and bow and cup and split out of the wood. So part of this video series, to this point anyways, has been dealing with pallet lumber versus purchased lumber. The planning, design, milling stage, all that is pretty much the same for pallet or purchased wood. But you get to see the contrast here. And for many cases, it's just totally impractical to use pallet lumber for this sort of project. The time I've spent fussing around with this stuff, going out and getting it, there's no way that that's economical versus just going out and buying lumber that's ready to mill and build a door frame out of. But I like the challenge of this unique approach, and it's kind of a good feeling to know that instead of turning into lawn mulch or compost, these pallets get to turn into a pretty cool door. And because I'm covering this part of the door build in the episode format, I think I'll take a little time and go into what it takes to get a piece of lumber like this that's rough in every aspect and uh, turn it into something that I can rely on that's going to be consistent and accurate for a door frame. This poor piece of cherry here has about every melody that a piece of wood can have. It's got severe checking in it. It's deformed because of the unequal drying process. This is the center of the cherry tree here. That always causes instability. The piece has got a pretty serious bow in it. The surface of the wood here is cupped. And despite all those problems, to make matters worse, this piece has a pretty noticeable twist in it. And twist is a little harder to see and to understand and to deal with. A cup and a bow, those are pretty straightforward to get rid of. Twist is the most difficult, but working with rough lumber and pallet wood in particular, you got to know how to do it. So I'll show you the quick and easy way where you can spot twist, and then when I go to the joiner, I'll try to explain how I take it out of a piece. I guess I can add a side note is that a cup can be taken out with a thickness planer with care. A bow can be taken out with a table saw with a straightening jig, but twist can only be practically removed with a joiner. It can be done with a lot of meticulous, tedious, and very accurate hand plane work, but like I said, the joiner is the practical way, even though it's not the only possible way. A trained eye can pick up the twist in this board. It's shaped like a very inefficient airplane propeller with this end twisted this way, and this then twisted that way. There's probably about a quarter inch of twist over this eight foot length. That's way too much twist to work with, even though it's kind of obvious by eyeballing down the end of the lumber. The best way to pick up twist in shorter pieces or longer pieces with less twist is with a pair of winding sticks. This is a pair I made some years ago. It has a tagua nut pointer in the middle and a strip of very blonde maple in a piece of walnut. These are dead on straight and accurate. And this is how they work. I just place one stick at each end of the piece of wood and then eyeball across the top of the sticks. Like I said, this piece has got a very pronounced twist, so the winding sticks aren't really necessary. But if I flip the board end for end and reposition the winding sticks to a section of the board where there's less twist, you can see how the length of the sticks amplifies the twists and makes it more visible. 
And remember, the amount of twist is amplified by the length of the sticks. So a little bit of math is required to determine the actual twist. But over this 30 inch section of this piece, I'm guessing it's about a strong 16th of twist. And that's too much to have in any part of a door or a door frame. So it needs to be planed out in the milling process or it'll be a fight all the way through the project. There's an infinite number of questions that need to be asked and answered for straightening any piece of lumber. The worse they are, the more questions there are and the more decisions need to be made for getting the piece straight. The good news is once there's one straight flat face, the other five faces, the long ones and the short ones can all be indexed off that first flat face. That's why the joining step is so, uh, so important at this stage. With years of experience, all it takes is a quick eyeball on the end of a piece of lumber to evaluate what needs to be done and the quickest way to get it done. But by way of explanation, what I'm doing when I eyeball the end of the piece is looking for a perfectly straight line that will eliminate all the dips and bumps in the piece. Twist is separate. First off, I want to decide which face of the board to start off with. On a board that's rectangular in profile, uh, I can't think of an instance when I wouldn't do the widest, flattest face first. It makes the best indexing surface. But in general, most pieces will have a single warp in them or possibly an S-curve. But in my head, I'm thinking, do I want to have the, the bow going this way on the joiner or this way on the joiner? The bow down or the bow up? And generally, on longer pieces, I go with the bow side down. This piece has an S-hook in it, and I'll show it to you by using my Bosch Greenline laser as a straight line guide. And that green line is what my eyeball sees on this piece. The line is flush with the edge here. And on this end of the board, you can see it bows out here. And there's a hook at the end of the piece here. But what the joiner does is cut off all the wood that doesn't match up to a straight line that's represented by that green laser line. This piece is mostly bowed down this way because it hooks down here and it hooks down here. If I move this over to the other side of the board, you'll see the mirror image of it. When the line is flush at this end and flush at this dip, there's extra wood here on this end and a pronounced hump through this section. That's probably about 5 sixteenths of an inch. So in this case, I'm going to go after this side of the wood and straighten it out first because I think it'll be easier to remove that hump than to trim off those hooked tails of the piece. And here's a handheld shot of how the laser beam highlights how warped this particular piece of wood is. Again, this is just dealing with the straightness of it and not with the twist. I generally go over all roughs on wood before I run it over the joiner or run it through the thickness planer to get out sand and grit that'll dull the knives. And that's especially important with pallet wood. When I took these pallets apart, I was mindful to get every single nail out. If a nail broke off in the wood when I was cleaning it up, I would mark it with a big red circle or just cut the piece off so that I don't find the nail at this stage of the game. But I use a heavy wire tug brush to scrub out the surface of this rough sawn lumber. And a quick scrub like that will add considerable life to your knives, blades, and bits. I like to use Smurf gloves when handling pieces of lumber like this. It gives me a little better uh, traction with my grip. I've got the Powermatic PJ88 joiner out here in the middle of the floor. So I got eight, uh, eight feet of room on both the infeed and the outfeed side of the machine. And what you'll see here is the length of the infeed and outfeed table have a lot to do with the efficiency of the straightening process. The shorter the table is on the joiner, the more difficult it is to get all of the bow out of a piece and to get the twist out. If this joiner had eight feet of table on the infeed and outside, this would be a cakewalk. As it is, there's about four feet coming and going, which really helps. But I've done plenty of this on a four inch joiner with a little dinky table. And that's how you hone your skills to make it easier when you got a bigger machine. I'll start out with about an eighth inch depth of cut for this piece. You can see the twist in the piece here as I rock it. It's, uh, it's riding flat on the outfeed table, but the infeed table is up on this corner, and this is the amount of twist in half the board. That rocking motion is the twist. 
And I probably should be doing this master class with a shorter piece because it's easier to demonstrate, but I also want to show that it's possible on a piece of wood this long to get it dead flat and true with a properly set up joiner. So the ticket is to deal with this twist, and basically there's zero twist in the middle of the piece. One end is twisted up a quarter, the other end is twisted down in a quarter. So the middle of the piece is kind of what I'm shooting for. But when I pull, it, pull the workpiece all the way back to the infeed side, it wants to lay flat on that infeed table. And if I run it over the joiner like this, I've got to take a full half inch of twist out of the other end of the board, and it quickly reduces the thickness of the piece. But if I can average it out, take a quarter inch of twist out of this corner on this end, and this back underside corner on this end, when the center of the board passes over the cutter head, eventually it won't be taking any wood off. It'll be just straight across. I hope that makes sense. But what I've got to do from gauging how much twist is in the board with the winding sticks or with an eyeball is to rock up, rock the piece up on the infeed side half of that total twist when I start feeding it. And at this stage, it's as much art as science to gauge that initial cut. With a piece this long, with this much twist, complicated by a bow and a cup, it's going to be a wild guess, but I've got a fair amount of thickness to work with here, so I won't run out of wood before I eliminate the twist. And take note that the bottom of the piece, obviously, is all rough and dirty and uniform in appearance, more or less. But after the first pass, I'm expecting there to be a clean spot on this corner of the far end and of this corner on the close end. The more even those two pieces are, a uh, mirror image of each other, the better job I've done at tackling the twist. The piece will be tilted up in this direction as it crosses the cutter head, not parallel like this to the outfeed table. And you should be able to see my prediction of how much tilt the board needs to eliminate that twist the quickest. And I'll make this first pass without the dust collector running so you can see and hear what I'm talking about. But as I work through the process, I've definitely got to get the chips out of the machine or it'll clog up. And that's not the most desirable first pass because I got a decent patch of twist taken out here. But I got this big flat spot and then a pretty small amount of twist taken out of this end. I'll flip the board end for end and use this surface here to index the second pass. After the second pass, this whole end is flat, and there's just a little bit of uh, plane of twist planed off of this end. And with the board next to the fence, you can see how that bow is still present in the bottom of this beam. But you can see with the winding sticks that even though the board isn't completely planed on one face all the way across, the twist is gone. So I hope I'm giving you a pretty good idea of the steps it takes to correct a crooked piece of wood. Once this is planed out, if the wood is dry, it should pretty much stay straight. Sometimes with uh, this pallet wood, which is near the heart of the tree, there's some reaction in the wood even after it's dry, but this stuff feels pretty stable. Now that I've dealt with the twist in the board, I'm gonna plane the piece by taking more off of that end to straighten this out as soon as possible. There's probably another 3 16ths of dip in here, and I don't want to take the whole face down 3 16 I just have to lower this end. And I'll try to demonstrate that with the laser beam again. So rather than take the whole face down, take 3 16 off of this face and this whole face over here. I'm going to plane it at an angle more like this so it takes more of it off of this end because it's hooked down so much. And the way I plane basically 3 16 to nothing from this end to that end is split the difference and start in the middle. So I drop the board in at about 4 feet, about the middle. And I take a pass here that's 3 30 seconds of an inch. Just a little less than an eighth. And that'll plane 3 30 seconds to nothing from the middle to the end. I do that twice. I've got 3 16 the whole length of the board. And you can see by 
the rough sawn material here that my guess was off. It was probably almost three-eighths of an inch that still needed to come out. I could have taken a 3 16 pass twice, but I didn't. And I've got to be careful at this point when going past this rough sawn place to not put twist back in the board. And to do that, I always make sure my pressure is on a flat surface on the out feed table. Then uh, the piece that's coming on the in feed table just follows along to whatever the flat surface in the out feed table tells it to do. I'll hold this piece up to the camera. You can probably see it. Uh, there's no twist left in it. And this edge is getting mighty straight along here. Uh, looking on this side, you might be able to still see a dip here where it's where that rough sawn surface still exists. But a couple more passes and this will be dialed in. Yes, indeed. That right there is what we're after. The top of that piece is looking mighty fine. And you can see by eyeballing the winding sticks that this piece is twist free and proud. Woohoo! And you can see by the odd shape of this end of the piece how much twist there was in the board. And you get the same situation on the, on the other end of the piece. The better I do my job, the more equal the difference is in the thickness of the board from one edge to the other on both ends of the piece. Getting that right maximizes the yield that I can get out of a twisted timber. Now I've got all these pieces through that initial flattening, detwisting um, stage. So the next step will be to square up a corner, then rough rip them to width and thickness before I run them through the thickness planer. And that's because the difference in maximum to minimum thickness on these pieces, this one with the big hook in it, it's probably a half inch difference. If I was to run this through the thickness planer 1 16th of an inch at a time, which is a pretty good pass, it'd take eight passes to equalize that up. So Rather than do that, I'll square up a corner using the joiner and then rough rip them to billet size before I run them through the thickness planer to clean them up. Now these pieces look deceptively straight because there's one flat true surface. You can see how true they are by comparing them next to each other, flatten out. But to see where they came from, just put the other side of the board together and it gives you a picture of how much was taken off of these pieces. But I hope watching this process makes you hopeful of what can be done with even the roughest of lumber. I always check the joiner fence to make sure it's set perfectly square before making important cuts like this. And I decided to mill up these short cutoff pieces at the same time while I'm running this longer stuff because these will end up being plinth blocks for the casing on the, do uh, on the bottom of the door jams. Now that each one of these pieces has a perfectly straight and true 90 degree corner, I'll set up and take the next step, which will be to rip these so that all four faces are parallel. Because of the quantity of cuts I have to make with the blade set at full depth to rip these cherry billets down to a parallel shape, I've cleaned the blade with blade and bit cleaner and then given it a hefty coat of dry coat spray lubricant to reduce the strain on the table saw motor as much as possible. It takes a fair amount of force to push a chunk of hardwood this thick through a table saw blade, regardless of how clean and sharp the blade is. So I reach for my favorite push sticks, paying special attention to the note. Do not use remaining fingers as push sticks and keep between fingers and blade because there's no way 
I'm going to use two flimsy little long handled push sticks to push the work piece through for this operation. And with everything sharp, set up properly, and well tuned, a full heavy cut like that requires surprising little effort. I'm ripping the width first so that the blade can reach all the way through. Then when I make the cut for the other dimension, if the blade doesn't go all the way through, I can do it in two passes, one up and one down, because I have two parallel faces to index off. If these were bigger pieces, I'd have to resort to other methods, but this works great for this project. And I'm hoping that all these chunks will rip parallel at about three and an eighth inches, or maybe three inches at the least, because the finished jam width is five and three quarters, and I want to have enough room for milling and trimming later during and after glue up. Well, that's pretty much uh, the milling process from taking those rough, twisted, warped cups, split up uh, pallet runners and turning them into dimensional lumber. These are about two and a half by three and an eighth at this stage. I think it's telling to look at the scraps. You can see how much warp was cut off these pieces, varying degrees all through the process. And I hope that it makes sense why I decided to run it through the table saw at this stage, because it would have taken quite a bit of thickness planing to get this off of here. Plus, the outside of this is kind of dirty and it'll wear my knives quicker, even though I've cleaned this up. Once it's cut off with a saw blade though, it's clean, fresh wood, and I can run a whole lot more of it through the thickness planer without any negative effect. And I want to point out here too, that you're just watching me run all this stuff through a table saw. That blade's sticking up over two and a half inches. I'm pushing these huge pieces through there, um, dust processors running, and I've got to put a fair amount of energy into that piece, pay attention to the camera, pay attention to the audio, but pay attention to my fingers. Whenever you're doing this sort of operation, you got to pay attention. And as much as I want the video to come out good, I want the wood and my safety to be first. You notice on my saw, I don't have a riving knife, I don't have saw stop. Both of those would be very wonderful features for this type of work. and. If you're not comfortable using your machine, pushing your saw to these limits, there's other ways of going about this. You could do all the passes with a thickness planer, which in a lot of ways is safer than this. And again, this is like a NASCAR race here. My goal is to get around the track in a hurry. As long as I can stay safe, your goal needs to be to get around the track safely. So do what you need to do to accomplish that. With these pieces cleaned up, you can see on some of them, there's some burn marks from the saw just from stopping as I push it through. And a couple of the pieces still have some wane on them. I didn't want to cut the whole piece down that extra 3 16 of an inch because that'll ultimately end up getting trimmed off. But the next step will be to run the saw cut face through the thickness planer so everything's clean and true. And once the pieces are all clean and true, I'll figure out which piece is going to go where on which jam to glue these pieces up. And that'll be next. And in a little bit of Back to the Future drama, I've got to get into the computer because episode one of this build video has a premiere that's about to go live in four minutes. I'll see you there and then I'll see you back here. Back to the Future. As an aside here on this jam building episode, I had to switch out the knives in my DW735 thickness planer. If you want an in-depth a tutorial on the whole process. Check the video link here. But I just wanted to mention uh, for this time, I'm cleaning up some pretty serious resin from making those Samiki blocks. Some of that tropical hardwood has really weird resins and stuff in it. And it really gummed up uh, the cutter head, dulled the knives, and kind of made a mess of things in here. And what I want to mention in this little sidebar is blade and bit cleaner from the makers of Bowshield T9. I got a care package from Nick at Bowshield after we talked about testing out some of his products in the Next Level Carpentry Shop. So today I'm putting this blade and bit cleaner to the test. 
down inside the throat of this DW735 thickness planer. In the past, I've used other products for this, but I wanted to give this a run in this video just to show you how it works. This isn't a scientific test by any means, but you can see the gum down in here. And uh, I've put this uh, blade in bit cleaner. It's just a, a pump spray bottle. Uh, there's a chemical in here that does the actual softening of the resin, but it's not a, an obnoxious odor. And I've let this soak on here, and it really does a nice job of cleaning off that built up resin. One of these three gullets here was gummed up more than the others, but after a few minutes of soaking, that stuff is just cleaning right up. Well, I didn't plan on doing this video segment, so this whole thing is a little bit impromptu. But there's one more section here that I haven't sprayed with the blade and bit cleaner yet, so you can see how it works from the beginning. This spot right here is pretty thick and glummed on, so I'll give it a spritz of the cleaner. I've sprayed this whole inside throat area with silicone last time I changed the blades, so that helps this stuff release easier. But it's still pretty glummed on there until it has a chance to soak. I'm using a trimmed toothbrush for the scrubbing action here, I don't want a wire brush that will scratch the paint and the metal. But it doesn't take very long for that blade and bit cleaner to soften up this gummy resin so that I can clean it off. That was a short 30 seconds of soak time, and you can see that it really broke down that resin quickly. I can save myself some scrubbing action if I use a sharpened laminate chip to do a little pre-scraping and get this cleaner faster. But without the blade and bit cleaner, the scraping doesn't do much good. But after the cleaner, it works like a charm. And shining a flashlight down in there, you can see this is cleaned down to metal in fairly short order. So after soaking and scrubbing and scraping the heavy buildup areas, I just use a light mist of the blade and bit cleaner to tidy everything up. And with a paper towel and a little compressed air, everything spiffed up and ready for new blades. But I add a mist of silicone to the whole throat area just to make cleaning next time easy like this was. And based on that performance for cleaning up this stubborn resin inside this planer throat. I'd recommend this blade and bit cleaner. Uh, I, and I'll say it again, I didn't do any kind of a scientific comparison uh, for the chemical, uh, for the cost per volume, for the speed in a side-by-side -side comparison with other products. But I will say I like this stuff and I'll use it again and maybe do a little more evaluation for my own um, reference uh, cleaning some saw blades and stuff. So for now, thanks Nick for the blade and bit cleaner. I appreciate you sending that. It works great here. And uh, I'm going to go back to work making my cardboard door jam mock-up now that the planer has a new set of knives. Well, here we are back to the future. Uh, the premiere of episode one of this video just finished. Thanks everybody for checking that out. Um, but I, I got all these pieces um, run through the thickness planer, so all the burn marks from the saw blade and unevenness from that um, resaw are all gone. And this is what I've ended up with. And compared to what we started off with a little while ago before that milling, uh, I think this is a pretty decent transformation. And now with all this stuff pretty much defined, I think you can see the different thicknesses here, depending on how much was planed off of the boards to get them straight. I know what I've got to work with. Most of these pieces have a good face and a bad face. This is checked. Most of them got something nasty on one side. Uh, edges are better and worse, but because I need to end up with this size of a jam that I can barely get out of these pieces, what I'll do is pick the best faces of the long ones and the best faces of these intermediate ones, and then I'll resaw them down so that they'll they're big enough to make these jams out of. And once I've got all those decisions made, I'll show the rip process. I'm thankful that getting these pieces sorted out and matched up was easier than I thought. Fortunately, the grain in these different pieces complements each other uh, pretty well without a lot of struggle. And these chunks for the head jam are a good example. Uh, this would be a good grain matchup, but I'd have to use this gnarly spot here, which I prefer not to. And these two remaining pieces look nice together. I use a orientation mark, basically just a triangle like that, so that these pieces always go back together the same way. And that's a very fortunate matchup with so little effort. You can see the same thing on these long pieces. I love the way this matches up here. I'll make sure that comes back together because this grain just crosses over. Looks like it grew there. And by contrast, if I use the other end of the same piece, you can see that the grain jumps a lot farther between the two pieces. 
So that's what I call a fortunate matchup because that is just about perfect. And because I'm working with this pellet lumber instead of lumber that I bought specifically for this job, I've got a little conundrum here that has to be worked out to move forward. And that conundrum is, this is what the finished jam profile looks like. Two inches thick to one inch thick on this piece, the other jam or the head and the other leg will be inch and a half and three quarters. But I've got this big step in here. This was milled out of a solid block and I just rabbited this whole huge piece out here. But since I'm starting out with two separate pieces, the natural order would be to just glue it up flush and rabbit this piece out. But because it's this pallet wood, the grain here matches up. But the grain, if I take three quarters of an inch off this piece, it might not match up so well anymore. Plus I'll just be wasting all that good wood and be getting into the bad side of these pieces. With regular uh, eight quarter kiln dried lumber, you don't have as much change. Uh, you don't have issues with so much change through the piece. So I'm gonna do an offset glue up for this jam. And what I mean by that is I'm gonna mill these pieces so that everything fits with an offset at about 11 16 The final offset here in the jam is exactly three quarters. If I glue it up flush, I'd have to mill off a full three quarters. If I glue it up offset like this at 11 16 I'll only be removing a 16th of an inch from this surface and that'll keep everything all even and true, but it does add a level of complexity. As it turns out, the width of these billets is just barely wide enough to contain this show face of the jam here. That's all I've got. I've got about barely an eighth of an inch for everything to be trued up and glued up and then a final width pass to make a consistent part. So I can't get sloppy with any of these steps here. But fortunately, I've got this much play on the rabbited side of the jam, so I can use this extra width here to engage a rabbit that will index the two parts. You'll see what I mean as that goes forward. And I'll make the overall thickness of the hinge jam just a little over two inches so I can mill it down to exactly two, and I'll do the same with this headpiece, uh, go about an inch and nine sixteenths, so I've got a sixteenth of an inch to true it up. And I'll go through the steps with the head jam just because the pieces are shorter and easier to demonstrate. I came out to the shop tonight and discovered what is called in polite company a predicament. And the predicament has to do with process. I did the glue caddy build video and the whole thing was about process. Well, here's a situation that demonstrates what happens when process goes wrong. I made this mock-up jam out of a solid chunk of poplar. I cut this rabbit using the table saw. I made a pass in vertically for this and another pass this way to cut this rabbit piece out. And my thinking was that would give me the shape, but when I get to the final jam, I thought I would do that. I would cut this rabbit at 11 16 and then plane the final 16th of an inch of thickness out of there on the joiner to make sure I had an accurate step in the jam. Well, that's all well and good, but I glued this piece up. This is the head jam for the door, and I did this kind of as a, a test of the process, the sequence. And tonight, when I went to take the next step and mill this face down a sixteenth of an inch, I realized there's a little problem here. From past videos, viewers know what this PJ88 joiner is capable of. Well, despite all of its wonderful capabilities, it's lacking one thing. The rabbiting ledge and a rabbiting tip on the cutter head allow this joiner to make perfect rabbits in a piece of wood like this, but it can only make them a half inch deep. So I'm not able to use this process in the sequence to mill the face of this jam a sixteenth of an inch off. So this predicament tells me two things. One is I need to come up with a different plan for the rest of the jams. And the other one is I created extra work for myself because I'm going to have to cut this face of this carefully with a table saw. That's the only way I have to get in here and clean this up. And then I'm going to have to sand and scrape all those saw blade marks out of there. Well, the good thing is I only have to do it to the head jam and I'll come up with plan B and a new sequence for the two legs of the jam. I guess it justifies what's been said. As a carpenter, you're only as good as the mistakes you can fix. Let's see how good I am. Making a cut with the blade raised that far and cutting something this thin and cutting this little shoulder off, I want to make sure that this tongue of wood is completely parallel, meaning the blade needs to be perfectly parallel to the rip fence. 
and this cut will be made a 64th of an inch less than 13 sixteenths of an inch all the way which will give a step that's three quarters of an inch. And that's a big, bold cut, but with a sharp blade, a good setup, and a steady feed rate, the result is going to be more than acceptable. And I've got the three-quarter inch step that I need for the finished jam. The jam here is 13 sixteenths, and I need to end up at three-quarters. And this is that same sixteenth of an inch over an inch and a half for the finished width I want. I could just leave this, but I'm going to totally eradicate my little predicament here by milling the back surface of this jam so that it ends up at the dimension I planned on. It's more difficult to film the fix for this predicament than it is to actually fix it. I simply took a strip of wood and ripped it to precisely the same thickness as the step in this rabbit, three quarters of an inch, and then attached it to my planer platen with a couple of screws. Now this rabbited jam will pass through the thickness planer with this surface perfectly parallel to the planer's platen. I can take off a skinny sixteenth of an inch, end up with three quarters of an inch here, and inch and a half here. A lug on the back of the platen keeps it from being pulled through the planer with the jam. Three quarters, three quarters, inch and a half. Just like I planned it, right? Makes me wish all my predicaments were this easy to get out of. And to completely eradicate my mistake and reestablish my position as a carpenter, I use a sharpened putty knife like a card scraper to remove the faint marks from saw teeth when I made that deep rip. The nice thing about a putty knife is that it has this acute angle on the edge and the corner of the knife gets right into the very corner of that rabbit. So it's crisp, sharp, clean, and square. Without a sawtooth mark to be seen. And that is a wabbit I can live with. And that little exercise in embarrassment taught me two things. One is that I can get myself out of a jam, <laughs> get it out of a jam. The other thing is that I need to come up with a different process for doing this. And it's clear to me now that I need to mill the jam pieces a sixteenth over thickness, but I need to glue them up and make sure the step is exactly three quarters of an inch. This is a little bit more complicated than most jams because it's the exterior style. A regular interior jam is just a flat piece of wood. So you get to see some extra steps that can be done if your end goal is to come up with something more complicated. Same steps, just a few more of them. Hanging doors is usually thought of as general carpentry, but making doors, in my thinking, is advanced carpentry. To do it effectively and efficiently, it takes some pretty serious equipment, sharp tools that are well tuned up with plenty of power to make robust cuts in high grade materials. On lesser equipment, making rips through pieces of solid hardwood like this is beyond the capability of the machine. But with a good grade cabinet saw, a clean sharp rip blade, a steady feed rate, and a steady hand, this is pretty much routine for a door making shop. I'm actually milling each of these pieces an extra sixteenth of an inch thick so that I can plane the saw marks out before the glue up. So I think I'm going to use this opportunity to wrap up episode two of this custom door design build uh, video series. I've got these pieces uh, milled down. You saw the process coming from rough pallet lumber to this stage. I've got the blanks for these jams milled so that they're exactly three quarters of an inch uh, different in thickness. It's the same for the strike jam and the thicker hinge jam. The step is three quarters of an inch. And this is a natural transition spot from the rough milling, getting it to this stage where from here it's pretty much finished milling to finish up these jams, which will include joinery for glue up, etc. The transition between episodes is bound to be a little choppy till I get used to this process, but I hope there's some value in what you've seen here, the steps, the process, the thought process, 
for ending up with this, how to get out of a predicament should you find yourself in one, and that sort of thing. I want to thank everybody for watching this video series. I hope you'll stick with it as it progresses. It's bound to get more exciting as it goes along. And if you like this sort of content, I'd appreciate that you consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. Poke the thumbs up button. You can hit it with your thumb or your finger or slap it with your hand, whatever it takes. Hit the thumbs up button so YouTube knows that I'm not asleep at the switch over here at Next Level Carpentry. You can find a list of tools and materials in the video description below. Those are from Amazon where they're the same low online cost to you, but Jeff Bezos costs up a little bit of his cash and sends it my way to help support video production here at the channel. T-shirts like this and other ones are available on Teespring. Links in the video description. And as I roll out, I want to thank all the patrons, new and old, on the, the growing list. Everyone on that list has gone above and beyond to support the channel, which I really appreciate. It's not going to show up in this video elsewhere, but FYI, this is New Year's Eve 2019, about to head into a new day, a new week, a new month, a new year, and a new decade. Pretty remarkable. I'm excited about where this channel has come from and where it's headed. 2019 was a big year, crossing over the threshold of 100,000 subscribers. Uh, as of tonight, it's 126,000 and going strong. And that wouldn't be possible without your views, participation, and comments. So I appreciate that, and I wish each and every one of you all the best in 2020 and beyond. Happy New Year from Next Level Carpentry. The sad part is, that old cardboard door, his days are numbered.